Good morning, everyone. My name is Gandhi Daniels, and I am the Executive Director of the Wellness Coalition. I would like to welcome you to the Wellness Coalition's third breastfeeding webinar. For those of you who are not familiar with the Wellness Coalition, the agency has been in existence for 21 years, serving the citizens of the River Region in Alabama. We are a nonprofit organization, and our mission is to facilitate or coordinate community-wide system to improve the health and wellness of people with limited or no health insurance through collaboration, services, and education. Some of the services we offer are case management, insurance and enrollment, and community wellness programs, such as chronic disease self-management, diabetes self-management, and the diabetes prevention programs. The Wellness Coalition also makes referrals to other community partners to meet the needs in the community. Today, we are here to inform you about how being supportive to a breastfeeding mom enhances her success with achieving her breastfeeding goal through a Centers for Disease CDC REACH grant. This is our third webinar in a series of four. I hope you can gain the needed information to help support a breastfeeding mother so that more childbearing age women will, be, will begin to breastfeed their babies. The webinar will last for two hours and we hope you will join us and tell a friend to join us for our final webinar next month. Social workers and nurses can obtain continuing education credits and contact hours for this webinar. Social workers can receive two education credits and nurses can receive 2.4 contact hours. To be eligible, you must register for the webinar, attend the entire webinar, and pay the $8 for the credits. You would have seen the link when you registered. We are requesting that everyone complete the short evaluation form that will be emailed to you following this webinar. The evaluation will come from the Wellness Coalition's conference email account. We hope you will take a few moments to complete the evaluation and provide feedback to the speakers and the agencies about your experience today. Thank you for joining us and I hope you enjoy this webinar. Now we'll have Ms. Dorica Vaughn, Community Liaison, to tell you about REACH. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I am Dorica Vaughn. I will give you a brief overview about REACH. REACH stands for Racial and Ethnic Approaches to Community Health. It is a five-year cooperative agreement with the CDC and we are currently in our second year. Our priority population is low-income, low-educated African-Americans located in 42 census tracts in Lowndes, Macon, and Montgomery counties. Um, we focus, our focus is to increase health care access as well as healthy food access through various strategies including healthy corner stores, health ministries, tobacco cessation, breastfeeding education, and clinical community linkages. Our breastfeeding goal is to increase the number of, of continuity of care, community support actions implemented to amplify and encourage breastfeeding. Um, now we will have Adela Smith to go over some housekeeping rules as well as be our moderator for today's webinar. Excuse me. Thank you, Dorica. Good morning, everybody. As she said, I'm Adela Smith. I'm one of the breastfeeding consultants for the Wellness Coalition. I want to go over a few housekeeping uh, items with you. Make sure your mics and cameras are turned off for the duration of the webinar, but we do encourage open discussion in the chat box down at the bottom. When you're chatting, make sure you select panelists and attendees so that everybody can see your comments. Uh, use the Q&A box to submit any questions, uh, any questions you have. We'll try to make sure the speakers answer them live during that portion of the panel. And please make sure you complete the survey that's going to come to your email at the end of the webinar. Your future, your, your feedback rather helps us plan future events um, and webinars. And so we want to go ahead and jump right into the panel. Uh, we have a lot of people today. Uh, this is a, if you've been with us so far, this is a different style. So we have a panel style discussion today, which I'm really excited about. We have Ashley Jernigan. Uh, she's the founder of the PR firm. 
JDB Hospitality. Some of her work uh, includes project management for Alabama's Bicentennial Celebration, the dinner on Dexter, um, as well as most recently the city of Montgomery's vigil for Congressman John Lewis. Uh, she's also a faculty trainer for Troy University, continuing education and outreach, and she's a member of the Montgomery Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors. We also have Cedric Herbert. He is a general partner and senior tax accountant with Interurban uh, Accounting and Tax Service. He's a deacon at his church. He is a Lowndes County native. I have to say that or else he'll get me. He's from Fort Deposit. Um, he's an Alabama State University alumni. He is a member of Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated. And most importantly to him, he is the proud husband to Amber and proud father to their three children. Next, we have Layla Allen. Uh, Layla is a certified life and career coach. She is the owner of Melanated Millennial Consulting and also the co-founder of the grassroots youth organization, The Missing Link. She's a graduate of the University of Toledo. She's also a wife and a mom of two. We have Savannah Sims. Savannah is a licensed independent clinical social worker and she's the owner of the private practice of For Healing. Her experience um, and work ranges from serving youth as well as adults. She's an alumna of the University of Alabama as well as USC, and she's also a wife and mom of two. And last but not least, we have Cher Seeley. She is a registered nurse and international board certified lactation consultant. She once owned a private practice for over two decades, serving families in the River Region that were choosing to breastfeed, and now she serves as one of two breastfeeding consultants for the Wellness Coalition. And so that should be all of our panel. I'm really, really excited. And panel, if everybody's on screen and everybody can uh, go ahead and unmute themselves, I'll go ahead and jump right in. We've got a lot of questions. I know we'll have questions that are going to come in the chat or in the Q&A section that I'll try to keep up with for you. Um, just so everybody knows what position or what perspective it is that you're coming from, um, I want to go ahead and start with Ashley. Uh, can you tell us, and I'll ask this to everybody, to just tell us what it is in a, you know, in a few words, what your relationship is to breastfeeding. Ashley, you can go ahead and we'll just move on from there. Okay, hello. Uh, see that I'm Ashley Jernigan. Uh, I, I like that you call me a successful breastfeeding mom. I'll definitely take that one. Uh, I am uh, been breastfeeding. This is my two-year-old right here, and this is my four-month-old right here. Um, and I was able to uh, breastfeed her until she weaned herself off, uh, and then I plan on doing the same for him. So I'm, and I went through many trials and tribulations that sometimes never actually get put out to the world because we all kind of keep that strong mama face. So I'm happy to be here to talk about that and um, my process and, and being able to hopefully help some other ones be as successful as I feel I was. Next on my screen, I see Cedric said, can you go ahead and tell us your relationship to breastfeeding? All right. Um, me and my wife, we have three children, um, seven-year-old, three-year-old, and right now, currently an eight-month-old girl. So um, all three of our children breastfeeding. Of course, the youngest one, she's eight months old. She's currently breastfeeding. Um, no major issues um, that we had, just mainly uh, just being aware. I, I think a lot of it uh, is attributed to the fact that my wife uh, does a lot of research and she, uh, you know, she gets, she lets me know what she needs and Whatever, whatever support I can add, I, that's what I do. Next, we'll go to Savannah. Good morning. Um, my breastfeeding journey start, started, um, I have a six-year-old and a four-year-old. Um, both of them I was able to breastfeed for two years each. Um, I worked full time, um, and so I come with the perspective of breastfeeding and pumping um, in the workplace and having a supportive environment where I was able to um, breastfeed for an extended period of time. Um, I did go through several different you know, trials trying to figure out what works best, how to keep up my milk supply, um, the correct pumping schedule, just because you know, you're working, you got to keep your supply up. Um, and so I have you know, different things that I've used and how I've spread that. Um, and able to be successful um, for those two years. 
and then I'm going to come to Layla. I'm just looking at my screen. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm basically from the opposite end of the spectrum when it comes to um, breastfeeding compared to um, the other speakers that we have today. Um, I'm speaking from the perspective of someone that has attempted to breastfeed. I have two children, one age six, not, well, seven now, and then also a three-year-old. Um, I'm open to sharing my experience and some of the things that I went through. And then also, um, in hindsight, just thinking of some of the opportunities that I probably should have pursued or taken advantage of at that time. So I'm ready to have that discussion. And last but certainly not least, share. Hey, everybody. Well, my experience goes back many, many years. Um, my youngest is now 37. And I was not successful with my first baby, um, made it two weeks. So um, I want to say hats off to Cedric for being here because I've told this story many times, had it not been for my husband's support. Um, the second time around, I would not be here in front of you today. Um, the father's support can be so important. And I realize not all women have that. But that's why we're having this discussion today, because it's about finding that support for yourself. Right, so now perspective and where they're coming from, I just want to add another level of context before we really, really dig into these questions. Um, just by a show of hands real quick, who actually knew somebody in their family? Like, were you breastfed or do you know somebody in your family that did or do you have friends that did? Just by a show of hands. One, two, three, four. Interesting, interesting enough. And Sherry, you on the, on the other end, you didn't have no. anybody around. No. So that's really interesting, especially knowing that you are um, an IBCLC. So that, that makes for an interesting piece and an interesting take. So I'm going to jump right into these questions. I'm going to say some questions. <laughs> it's some questions. So I'm going to give this, actually, everybody can answer this question. So the first question says, did you have a specific goal before your child or children came when it came to breastfeeding? And whoever wants to start with that, you can just jump right in. I'll start. My goal was three months. I have no idea where I came up with that, why I came up with it, how. I just thought, well, I can, I'll try three months. Um, and, and I'll tell you now that I was still struggling at three months, but continued on. I'll say I just said a year. That was my goal was can I, can I get to a year uh, I think Ashley might have frozen up on us. Um, somebody else can go ahead and throw in and answer that question. Did you have a specific goal, Layla? Um, with my first child, I didn't so much have a goal. I think um, at the age of 20 and then me also being in college at that same time, um, I was just hoping that I can kind of get into it and make that transition. But with my second child, just considering what I had gone through with the first one, I did have a goal set and my goal was set for a year. Um, I think and, for me, oh, I'm sorry. You go ahead, Savannah. Okay. Um, so at first my goal was six months. When I was pregnant, I was like, you know, I'm gonna do it for six months. I'll, I'll be good by then. Um, but when my first son was born, um, when we got to month three, I was like, you know what, I need to, to breastfeed as long as I can. Um, and that's when I kind of changed it out to, to two years. Yeah, I think with our first child, I don't know. I, I never really had that conversation with my wife about what her goal was. Um, at the end of the day, I think we were kind of in a, in a situation where it just allowed her to um, do it indefinitely, really, because um, um, I, she was, she was a house, house. She wasn't necessarily a housewife, but we had moved, and I was working, and she was trying to find somewhere. And then my son came, and it was kind of like, well, as long as the bills keep it getting paid, and um, we ain't got to, we don't have to buy formula. So, I mean, 
our daycare. So, you know, it's like, hey, let's, let's keep it going, keep the party going. So um, no goals. I think with the second go around uh, with Levi, um, there was sort of um, a plan in place because by the end she was back in the workforce and I was working and well, I was actually becoming an entrepreneur. So I actually had left the workforce and started my own business. And so we had to have a plan in place. And so with that, it was a lot of supplementation and things like that. So, um, and now with the young baby, Chloe, my wife was actually going, coming off maternity leave when the quarantine started. So where Chloe was supposed to be just maybe like three or four months, now eight months in down the road because of quarantine, Chloe's, you know, that plan hasn't been deviated. So uh, we, we, we come with a plan and then next thing you know, it's, it's always whatever life gives you. Uh, said you kind of sound like uh, myself and my husband or you and your wife do because it was kind of like hey it's free we don't have to buy formula and then <laughs> and then I'm like you well, here comes when the, I, the and first time I had to buy formula I was like hold up <laughs> I, I understand I understand I've heard pumps, it somewhere <laughs> around $36 a can or something like that yeah yeah. <laughs> so for me, I know that was an incentive for myself um, and my husband as well. And I'm with you on the quarantine thing, having an infant that kind that kind of helped that because you didn't have to rush right back out into life as we once knew it. Um, so I think that definitely helped. Um, and there are so many questions, and I really don't know which one I want to ask first. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. For those of you who are working outside of the house, Sid, I know you mentioned your wife going back to work at some point. I want to throw this question to Savannah and Ashley. How did that look for you to continue on your journey and still be able to work outside of the home? I start. Um, what it looks like is really coming up with a strict pumping schedule. I pump three times a day. Um, and then we had a babysitter because I didn't um, have a daycare at the time. And so I let her know um, about preparing the milk and swirling it and all those kind of things. Uh, so we really had a plan in place um, to make sure that I could pump enough. Um, and then I would let my employer know, you know, hey, I need to pump three times. It'll take me maybe 20, 30 minutes to pump, but I do need this time um, and I need a private place to pump. And they were more than willing to accommodate that. Uh, I think I was kind of different where I, I actually uh, took my daughter with me everywhere. It was a running joke because they knew that if I was going to be there, she was going to be with me. Uh, and to be honest, um, I did an entire kind of um, about face with my career, really totally wrapped around my children, uh, around my child. I said I was going to, I created an environment that allowed me to take her everywhere I needed to go. Uh, I actually quit my job in 2016. Uh, because I had been with my husband 10 years and we weren't pregnant. And three months later, I got pregnant. Uh, and so and so I was able to keep clients and I took my daughter with me and, I li and I've nursed everywhere. I think I said that um, I was a nurse in the church pew mama. I was a nurse at the restaurant mama. I was a nurse in front of my clients mama. And I kind of, I did not make it feel weird. So they could not say it was weird. You know, I was not apologetic. I wasn't but it was a part of what I was doing. And I made a, 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 a note to myself that for, I said 75% of the time, if my daughter can't go with me, then I'm just not going. You know, there's gonna be times in which I can't go and that's fine. But uh, um, I understand Savannah, I, I hate the pump. <laughs> Absolutely can't stand it. And I do everything in my power to not use it, which means the baby is coming with me. And um, it became, all my clients knew they were going to see Helena with me, and that's it. And that's a big, both of y'all touched on two things, but really three things all in one that definitely required uh, some more prodding, if you will. So you mentioned nursing in public, and that is a big deal for um, a lot of people. You can look, you can talk to anybody, you can, you can be at church, you can look up and down social media, and somebody's going to say something about someone who is nursing in public or why do you have that on or why don't you put this on or why don't you do that and everybody has an opinion about what mom should be doing 
uh, with her body or with the baby. And so you said, you you know, uh, it, it doesn't matter to me or whatever else. And I'm kind of the same way. Cher, I want to throw this question to you. Um, this is something that's been a part of your life for probably as long as most of us have been living or close to it. Was that a bigger deal around that time when you were coming along raising children? I have to say way bigger because breastfeeding rate has only gone up. And in 1983, when my youngest was born, um, it was just beginning to go up, I guess you would say. There were no lactation consultants. You have to realize that. No internet. Um, no help for breastfeeding. And I remember, now I found the Leche League, uh, which is an international mother-to-mother uh, -mother support group, which is what got me through the hard time. I made it three months and was still struggling, as I said. And once I found that group and got my support, things changed. And I felt empowered to breastfeed in public. I never remember seeing a single other mother beside myself breastfeeding in public during that time. I remember sitting in the ladies room at um, Parisian, I believe it was, and a, a, a woman came in and said to me, oh, I didn't know people were doing that. And I, I assumed she meant breastfeeding, I don't know. I remember sitting at the Eastdale Mall and breastfeeding in public when an elderly gentleman came over to me and said, oh, can I see your baby? And I was so thrilled that he didn't understand or didn't see or notice that I was breastfeeding her. And he was quite embarrassed when I told him, I'm sorry, she's eating right now. So you learn how to do it. Um, and that was a, it was a wonderful thing, very liberating to not have to take a bottle because we didn't have pumps like, like you have today. We had horrible pumps. So um, I had no other choice is the way I felt about it. And so with whatever, you know, with all that comes with breastfeeding in public, doing it, not doing it, bottles, pumps, all of those things. For, and this question is for everybody. Um, Layla, I want to go to you. Do you ever feel like your decision to, be, to breastfeed or your attempt not going the way you planned it to, do you ever feel like you were judged for that at any point in time? And I want everybody else to answer that question too. Do you feel like your decision with this was judged, Layla? Certainly. I mean, I think either way, whether you decide to breastfeed in public or you attempt to breastfeed and it doesn't exactly work out, there's going to be some type of judgment or even if it's a thought that's not communicated or articulated, um, it, it is to arise. And outside of just feeling judged um, at, at certain points, you, you could feel less than or have those um, feelings of, I guess, not necessarily being like, or just to be completely transparent, even the conversation or the comparison of successful versus unsuccessful. Um, those words, they, they do draw out like certain emotions, I would say for me specifically, um, because it is something that I attempted to do, tried to do, cried doing it, <laughs> and it just so happened to just not work out. Um, it is, it's disheartening. And even considering that, I don't know, it's just so crazy that even if I have another child, I'm still going to try again. <laughs> but I feel as though now at age 28, I'm better equipped to do mm -hmm. it. But there is still that undertone of judgment that I can feel at certain points. I'll probably say, uh, it's funny that you say that, Layla, because uh, when I, I know this is silly, but when I saw that Savannah went two years, I almost felt like, well, dang, was I considered successful? You know, and so isn't that crazy how that works? Because um, I was like, well, shoot, you know, even though she winged herself off, I didn't make her stop, but I was like, well, then can I, is, can I call myself that, you know, and, and is that, does that make sense? And, and similar to you, um, I had a friend of mine, we happen to have babies at the same time, and I told her, I'm tired of crying in the middle of the night. That's what I told her when I was, when I was not understanding how breastfeeding worked. I said, I'm tired of it. 
I'm tired of crying in the middle of the night. I'm tired of sore nipples. I'm tired of what is going on. This uh, lanolin ain't ain't hitting on nothing, you know. And so I was I was um I was through it, you know. And so when I when we talk about it, um, one thing I teach with Troy is something called self talk, and self talk can totally you know depending on how you talk to yourself. And then if you have other people, like Cher was saying how other people weren't like totally on board with it either, it causes even a bigger issue, right? And so I was around people who kept telling me, just use formula. Even though they breastfed too, it was a, it was like, okay, sure, you can breastfeed, but just use formula, you know? And I was like, you're right. If I ever have to use formula, I will. However, I want to give my 100% effort and then make the decision because if I need to, I will. I don't have a problem with that. But it was almost like I was feeling like it was being forced on me to to say, why would you dare go through that when you could just use formula? You know, and I was trying my hardest to be like, I know I can and I 100% will if I have to. But let me get through this. And I actually went to a lactation. I went to lactation classes every two weeks. I think it was every two weeks or every week. And to the point where the lactation nurse was was um, was massaging me as I began to latch on, because she said I was so tense that even the baby could sense I was tense. And she would massage my shoulders to make me relax, to allow a letdown. Like it was, it took that much like things happening to make it to make me feel comfortable. And if I didn't have that, you know, then it would have been a different environment. Even though I said I I I was around people who breastfed, they just breastfed they they um they gave formula whatever so i i i can totally understand that lately it looked like you were trying to add something the only thing because she kind of touched on like others and their input but um i think another driving force for me as well was like my doctor's visits like i was almost dreading checkups because i knew it was going to be a thing of the baby is not on, um, I don't know, at the, it's not, he's not growing at the right rate. Now there's a concern for his weight um, or possibly jaundice or not having that bowel movement. Uh-oh. Oh, sorry. Uh, but not having a bowel movement in enough time. And those were a lot of pressures that had me nervous and also pushed me closer and closer towards deciding to stop pursuing breastfeeding. Layla, I had that same problem with an unsupported pediatrician, one after the other. I kept trying to find one that would support me. I went through three of them, and then I'm gonna be honest with you all, I quit going. Um, I felt like my baby was healthy. I was trusting my mothering instincts, which the mm -hmm. League helped me to do. I knew she was reaching her milestones. Um, she was always thin, very thin, but she still is today. She's model thin. Um, she didn't get that from me, and I guess people were looking at me and thinking that's a skinny baby. But even, um, I, I say I quit. I, I didn't go to a pediatrician for a while, but we, we did come back to it. And at about nine months, I remember the pediatrician giving me the lecture about weaning. You know, okay, you need to think about weaning from breastfeeding. And I was uh, working towards becoming a La Leche League leader at that time. I had no intention of it. And when I let him know that, he said, oh, you're one of those people. So it can be difficult. Um, you, have to, you have to be strong and, and find your support in other ways and realize that I think of that as parenting advice, not medical advice from a pediatrician. So, be, so think about that when, when pediatricians are giving you advice. And can I go one step further, even when your OB is giving you advice? And so um, I, it was very important that I found a doctor who was progressed and I found a uh, nursing, I mean, a uh, delivery unit that was progressed because I was like, no, we're not doing pacifiers. No, you know, like, I don't know what I'm doing. And so until I do, I can't incorporate that into my routine because uh, I can't latch, I'm, my latch is crazy anyway. You know, like I was, so I don't need, the, mm -hmm. so I don't need any nipple confusion. And so I agree. And I was, it was clear and I was so grateful from my OB and I, I was at Jackson to my, to the delivery 
unit all the way to my pediatrician because uh, Helena was the same. She was very small. Um, she lost weight. I mean, she wasn't small when she came out, but she lost weight. And then um, my doctor kept saying she was like a cheerleader. And she, the pediatrician was like, okay, we'll give it another week. Come back in a week. Let's see if she gains some weight. As long as she's gaining, as long as she's pooping, you know, like she was like saying, we'll do this. She's like, we're going to, we're going to put off any other supplements until the very last chance. So let's just keep going, keep going. And it made me feel better. And it was like my, my coat of armor to everybody who told me she's a little, little, she's a little smaller, or maybe you should try this. And I was like, my, my doctor says she's okay. And I'm just going to come back in a week. And, and I'm going to come back next week. And I came back every week, I think for the first six weeks, I think, or which is apparently not normal, but it's just to make sure she wanted to check her weight and make sure I was okay. So that's just equally as important from start to finish. Instead, and Savannah, I didn't know if y'all wanted to jump in on this as well. Um, I'll add a few things about breastfeeding in public. I am one of those people, I, will, I was breastfeeding everywhere. Um, and luckily, when we were out places, I would get the look, but I would also give them a look like, if you say something, it's going to be a problem. Um, and so I was very confident in breastfeeding. Like, I knew I was going to do it. We, we weren't taking bottles because I had to pump all week. Um, so if I was going to a restaurant, believe me, if I was eating, my son was eating. Um, and my husband would have the same look as, you know, don't say anything, don't interrupt our dinner, um, just because I knew I was going to do it. Like, I wasn't going to let anybody try to stop me. Um, and as far as just having support, my family, um, nobody breastfed. Um, and it was just, I had one friend who was pregnant, um, same time as I was, her baby is about six months older than mine. Um, and she really pushed for me to breastfeed. And so when I was around family, they were like, you know, you know, go in the back room or, you know, go somewhere else and do that. And I was like, no, he's hungry. I'm going to feed him. That's the end of the conversation. If you don't like it, please close your eyes, but I'm going to do it. Um, and now my family is so supportive uh, because if they know people that are breastfeeding, they'll be like, you know, hey, call her. She'll tell you what to do. She'll help you out along the way. She's like, but she's going to tell it to you straight. Um, and I think that's a lot of times where moms, um, they, they lose confidence because so many people are telling them, you know, not to do it or to cover up or things like that. Um, when it's, you're, you're feeding your baby, it, it doesn't matter, you know, what other people think. Um, it's something that you're doing for your child. Um, and so I'm a strong believer in that. And I'll, I'll tell anybody that. Yeah, I, I, I piggyback on that. It's like, uh, as a father, um, your child, your mother, the mother and your child are um, the most important things to you. It's like, that's the reason why you go out to work hard. And, um, and when your wife is breastfeeding and you see your child eating, um you know that in that place that's like for a man that's kind of for me it's sacred you know it's like um that's a moment of protection and 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 i think that as as a culture i think that that's a place that we have to that we have to change the mindset when it comes down to that stigmatism that there's something wrong with a woman doing what god has purposed her body to do um so um yeah no it's it's like i have we haven't had any issues with other people like i don't really think about other people when we're out in public i think the only thing that really comes down to is the temperament of the child you know like with our first son he he wouldn't take a pacifier he wouldn't take a bottle he wouldn't take anything outside of his mom and we just didn't go places simply because we knew that he was going to shut the place down so uh, with the second child, you know, various temperaments, and now with Chloe, she she's like a little little angel. She doesn't, you know, she doesn't, you know, when she's hungry, she's like, uh, feed me, and it's like, nah. But with Cedric Junior, it's like, feed me now. He's like, see more, feed me, see more. So I mean, it 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 really at that point, it's like the baby dictates everything. It's like. Okay, do we have to take the baby out? Well, depends on where we are. Like, if we at the restaurant, then no, uh, you know. But if we at church, you know, then it might be something different. So, each his own. It's like, but at the end of the day, respect, respect the fact that this mother has chosen to breastfeed her child. And at any point in time, it doesn't matter how you feel. It's like, like, okay, um, what, what business is that of yours? All right. All right. 
Like, get out your feelings. And that, but and at the end of the day, that's how I feel. Like, get out your feelings, man. Like, they ain't got nothing to do with you. Like, like that does not, that is not going to affect you one way or the other at the end of the day. So mind your business. So nobody ever, nobody ever got in trouble by minding something that didn't have anything to do with them. Now, now those are facts. <laughs> no, those are the facts. Instead, um, have you ever, because you're, you know, we, everybody hit on a lot of really, really, really good points because everything we're talking about is centered around support. Have you ever found yourself in a position to um, have to take up for your wife when she's out in public nursing, whether it's church or wherever, any, you know, anywhere? Because that can become a point of contention. Savannah mentioned, hey, you know, don't, don't look at me crazy because this is what it is and it's going to happen. Have you found yourself in that position having to defend what's going on? Nah, but that might be because I'm 6'2", 270 and played offense line in, in college. You know, like, <laughs> I mean, you know, each is on. Like, it's various situations. Like, I, like I, you, know, you know, you know my background. You know what I used to do. So... I mean, what I found out in this world is that people know who to try. And, and in this world, we got people that, okay, well, who are the most vulnerable in society? It is our women and our children. And so um, I find that those cowards that, that feel as if they can, they have to victimize women and children to, to somehow have some sense of, of power or whatever. It, I don't know. I don't know what's wrong. I don't know what's wrong. I can't even put myself in that mindset to to be an individual to be like a man that would be like oh a mother feeding her child how dare you do that in public like you are an insult to humanity like no like for real like for thousands hundreds of thousands of years that's how human beings came to be about so it's like what's wrong with you what's where you're wiring it like like that oh somebody just somebody has to go and do something unnatural. I mean, no offense to anybody that has to do it, but I'm just saying, it's like, what is your problem with nature? Like, I'm just like, look, ain't nobody, I'm not going out in the woods and telling a bear that he can't eat rabbits. Like, I, it confuses me. It just, it just mm -hmm. really does. It's like, when I see people that have that mindset, my first interaction with it would be to say, you know, kick rocks, but no, I personally haven't had to have that problem. Now, my wife has never really told me any, any situations where she had it, had anything like that. But I me mean, knowing my wife is that if there was a situation like, well, if she was out in public by herself and she needed to breastfeed, chances are, I know my wife, she would be as discreet as possible when it comes down to it. So there are different people as it relates to it so like you got those that like hey look i'm at the table i don't care it's coming out and then you got those that say look i'm going to the car and i'm going to do it in the car because that's just them they don't they don't feel comfortable and that's based upon the individual so like like i said once again to each his own but if it ain't your business it ain't your business I think you said a mouthful right there. And I think all I think all the ladies can agree. <laughs> I think all the ladies can agree. Um, I want to go back to what Ashley, Layla, and Cher were saying on the on the healthcare end, where Cher had somebody, you know, on the on the pediatric end who was like, mm-mm, nope, oh, you're one of those. Ah. Where Ashley had cheerleaders in her corner. And for Layla, it was a fearful moment, like gotta go back what are they gonna say is my baby okay y'all have an entire spectrum a range of emotions and feelings of what people are experiencing when that you know when this is a part of their journey when this is what they're going through and I think we see very clearly from one end of the other as to how that support makes a difference on the healthcare end because people trust their healthcare providers they want to hear what it is that they have to say they're going to internalize what it is that they have to say and so that makes a big 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 difference was there ever and i want to go to layla any point in time where it was like so much with the healthcare provider where you was like okay this is my breaking point um I, I must not be doing this right and i'm done at what point in time did that happen or did that happen from a conversation with a healthcare provider I think me being done, it was really a combination of things, to be honest. 
Um, so I'm not even, because I think with my first child, I think I've maybe breastfed for like three months. Um, it was the, honestly, I don't know, maybe the, it was all of the, the frustration building up over time. One, internalized with myself, just feeling as though, like, why is it that I'm not producing? Um, and then also with the pediatrician, um, there was pressure there. I'm not sure exactly, like, which point specifically, but I think I reached the end of my rope with a visit, like, from my mom. She came to come visit. Um, and just like a little backstory, basically, when I had my first child, I was, it was my senior year of college at the University of Toledo. I had an apartment with my husband, who was my boyfriend at the time. I think I was like 20, he was 21. And my mother came to visit and she just kept telling me like, this baby is hungry. That's why she keeps crying. She's crying so much because she's hungry. And of little jokes of like, you got those, you got those breasts, but you can't, why are you got big boobs, but you're not giving out any milk. And I think like probably around that period, it was just like, all right, let me just give her the milk, give her the Similac. It initially started with trying to do both. Um, but, you know, as time goes on, it was just more convenient to just decide like, well, let me just do the Similac and I can kind of get through all of those emotions of feeling less than and, and kind of struggling and also too with my daughter crying and me thinking like oh it's, it's my fault is this is why she's crying so yeah that's that's that was kind of it for me can i say something i want to say something to you layla yeah you know i've done this for almost four decades and i've worked with thousands of breastfeeding mothers and talked with many that have felt like a failure and i've always said the same thing to them you didn't fail we failed you society failed you the healthcare industry failed you um we're still failing mothers today we don't have every doctor out there saying you should be breastfeeding and what can i do to help you breastfeed we don't get that in the hospital setting we don't get that from our friends and families always um we certainly don't get it from the general population and uh, advertising that still uses bottles as a symbol for babies. So it, it takes this whole shift of our, our entire culture to change that. So you have to realize you did the best you could under the situation. And I, I just have to believe you're going to do fine the next time around. And by the way, call me if you're <laughs> struggling. <laughs> I will. I will. Okay. Yes, that, that means the that means the world to have enough just enough support and for you to you know share the story about your mom because uh, the crazy part is none of these things are uncommon which is why share can say you know as as a society we failed you as providers we failed you as community you know we failed you and others and we continue to do so but thankfully we have open discussions and open dialogue like this. So that way we don't continue to, you know, push somebody off or fail somebody in a sense when it comes to this particular thing, especially within the black community, because that takes that takes on a whole other turn um, for, mo for multiple reasons, which I'm sure most of us at least know the baseline of. Uh, I want to say this, Layla, I know you, you know, shared your feelings of inadequacy. I've been that route, you know, in the hospital. I'm like, you know, she won't latch, she won't latch. Well, my first, like, she won't latch, she won't latch. It's like, oh, we'll just, just do this. But I like it actually delivered at Jackson with my first baby. And they were extremely supportive. Nobody let go of my hand. Everybody did everything they could do. Um, I had a pediatrician who didn't sway me one way or the other said, is this what you're going to do? Okay, well, make sure you're doing this. Make sure you're doing this. Make sure you're doing that. Because I had those same feelings of inadequacy when it's like, well, you won't last. Like, we got to use a nipple shield. I was at home about to cry every day for about two weeks. Like, I got to keep putting this thing on. I got to keep trying to make it work. Got to keep putting this thing on. I got to keep trying to make it work. And I remember my mom saying, oh, you know, you don't need to keep doing that. Just going to get used to it and you'll never get it right. You never get it right if you keep doing that. She's gonna get used to it and you'll never get it right. And then one day I was just like, I just I just wanna try and see if I can because I felt like why can't I do this if I'm a woman? 
Isn't this supposed to be normal? Isn't this supposed to be natural? Isn't this supposed to be easy? Why am I having such a hard time? Um, and eventually I persevered, you know, persevered through and it was like, okay, I made it through the first few weeks or whatever else. And it got, I won't say perfect, it got easier, it got better. And so, <laughs> and so I ranged somewhere between Ashley and Savannah with my first child um, to get to that point to say, okay, yes, we did it. And I'm like, said, I ain't got $36 for a candle formula every time we need some formula. It just can't happen that way. <laughs> That's not in the budget. Got to pay back student loans. <laughs> um, but coming from family, what comes from family makes a difference. What comes from the providers makes a difference. So, man, I know you mentioned the employer perspective. What the employers are saying or how they're accommodating makes a huge difference. There's not a single person that I know right now that's not in the workforce in some capacity, be it full-time or part-time. So on the employment end or on the employer side, what would you say worked the best? You said your employers are really, really flexible. How did that work out for you at the time? Um, I think for me, it was about just communication um, and just saying, you know, this is what I choose to do. This is my schedule. Um, are you going to work with it or not? Um, and with my first employer, we had, I think everybody in that office was pregnant and breastfeeding. And so my first employer was like, well, we have no choice. Like it was, I think, six of us um, that had babies, you know, at least five to six months, they were all together. And so they had no choice. They were like, well, everybody has, is on the same pump schedule because we knew, you know, everybody has to pump. And so our executive director was like, well, I, we know it's time to pump. Y'all go ahead and go. Everybody get to y'all's closed door. And we had little signs on the door and they were fine with it. Um, and then, um, when I moved to my next employer, uh, they had a breastfeeding room. Um, and so I was able to go um, downstairs and take that time where it was a quiet space. I knew I could pump in private. Um, and I, it, it made me feel a lot more confident. Like I, I know I can have a lid down. I know I can pump so many ounces of milk um, just because it's private. I know I'm not gonna be interrupted. Um, and that's my time. So it, it made for a great experience. It, it really did. Um, and having supportive employers um, it's so important because when you feel like, you know, you got to sneak and pump um, or you feel like everybody is, you know, holding that over your head because you're breastfeeding, it makes you not want to do it. Um, and as a result, your, your supply may go down or, you know, you may feel so frustrated or stressed out with your work that that affects your supply. Um, and so having that conversation uh, with your boss or your employer and saying, you know, this is something that I have to do. Um, and I researched a lot of like the laws and regulations so that if there was ever an issue, I knew what I was going to say. I knew how it was coming. Um, and I left it at that. Um, I, I'm a big person on speaking my mind, but I'm going to come with the facts when I say it. Um, and so that made a huge difference. I, I never had an issue in that aspect. Ashley, I know um, most recently with the newest baby, you um, you had the honor of taking the lead on coordinating the vigil for the late congressman john lewis and you mentioned to, just to me your story of <laughs> having to make having to make it all work still while trying to maintain the milk supply you want to share that real quick um well yes i still i know you said i should post it i still have to process that one but um but yeah, I literally, um, when I, the, the John Lewis vigil was in, I had to plan it in a week and it got the first couple days, I literally realized I was going five, six hours without pumping because I was like, oh, I have to get this done or, you know, I have to finish this out. And then I had to like check myself and tell myself, look now, you already know what you're supposed to be doing and you can't be letting, you can't let anything stop you from what you said you were going to do, which is breastfeed this baby, and you're not going to let your supply go down because of work or because of anything else. And so I literally, even on the day of event, the day before, in the middle of putting chairs out and and setting up um, parts of the event, I was running to my car for 20 minutes, pumping into, and I'm not going to lie, into a water bottle because that's all that I had right then at the time. <laughs> okay, so I'm I'm pumping. I had a, I put it all into water, but I had an ice pack in my, um, and a, and a, you know, a, a insulated bag. Cause I was like, look now, first off, this is liquid gold. And secondly, even, even if I can't use this, I'm not going to be at a point to where I am messing up my supply 
for work. And so if that, I told people knew, okay, I'll be back in 30 minutes. And it was not even a, in the middle of whatever, I'll be back. I, I was pumping um, on my way to the event. I left, changed, showered, and Luda's like, okay, I got to at least get a 10 minute pump in. I know I'm 10 minutes away. So I'm like in the car with, I have, I have the pumps that can pump themselves now. I invested in it. It's an investment. Uh, but I invested in uh, the pumps that I still had a, a, my Spectra, but it was, I didn't have to hold it, right? So it just sits there and does its thing. And so that was like, I had to just come up with how do I continue on? Instead of coming up with all the reasons why I cannot, how do I continue on to be able to do that? And I knew that that investment was worthwhile because then I could be in, I could be wherever I am, I can pop them in and I can keep the party moving. And so um, even though I still had a pump, I, I was hands-free. And that was the real thing for me was to be able to be hands-free. I could still send messages. I was on the phone. I was telling people where to put things, but I had to step away. And I think that that is the part where I understand what Savannah, you were saying too, is that you have to be very confident in what you're doing, right? Because you have to know this is what I've decided is what's most important. Because if not, just literally you'll just kind of I forgot sometimes like you would just literally be so caught up in work or feeling like I can't people are gonna be looking at me like where did Ashley go like I can't just stop and I'm like no you you made a commitment and you did it with your first and you're about to do it again with your second and there's no event big enough that's gonna stop me from doing what I need to do for my child and and it's all a mind pump and I'm pumping myself up and I bought the stuff so I couldn't give myself an excuse to say you know, oh, well, I'm just going to be low on supply for this week, or I'm going to just try to power pump all night or something. You know, it was like, no, no, I'm going a, I'm to a step away for 30 minutes, and I'll holler at y'all in a minute, so. And, and that's what it takes to keep it moving and keep it going, and Layla, I want to ask you this question, because I know, I know you personally, and I know that you have a background in HR, um, and they've both mentioned things about work situations and trying to maintain breastfeeding and things like that, did you at any point in time when you were kind of handling things in HR, I know you did a, a, a few different things um, in human resources, but did you at any point in time encounter such an issue with that with not maybe yourself or another employee um, having to try to manage breastfeeding or how was that managed with your company or was it never an issue? Um, it was never an issue I'm trying to think back to the capacities that i've worked in human resources um i have let's see i've worked at a stadium and it's not exactly um i'm trying to think i don't know that's never come up from anybody other health issues have come up um like health issues but nothing associated with breastfeeding or trying to find time to breastfeed or trying to have a space to breastfeed but what i can say is in the facilities that i've worked in none of them have ever had any designated breastfeeding areas or um a, a safe place for them to kind of go and breastfeed or any like encouragement or support around breastfeeding either and i think i think that's Part, I think that's part of the thing. Um, everybody, everybody's working, and I think part of it when it comes to breastfeeding is like, hey, I can't do this when I get back to work. You know, what am what am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? And you have people where Ashley is fully self-employed, so she's able to kind of move and do how she needs to do. Other people are like, you know, I work at TJ Maxx, and not about to let me just, you know, go hide in the coat room or, <laughs> or or whatever else to do what I need to do. There aren't enough accommodations, even though there are laws and legislation in place. Um, from the federal level all the way down to the state level to protect nursing mothers. Um, there absolutely needs to be more done, more centered around that. A lot of times it's not, hey, I need this whole big suite. Like at, uh, <laughs> like if you're at Atlanta the airport, they have like the, the mama mm -hmm. pods and stuff like that or a lot of different places, which are nice. I've been to a lot of airports and a lot of places with fabulous suites, but sometimes it's just, hey, I just need this, this little cubicle. I just need a quiet place. I just need a chair. I just need an electric outlet. I just need some privacy so I can go ahead and do this and make this happen because nobody should be in a bathroom trying to pump. That's unsanitary. You don't cook. Your kitchen is not in a bathroom. Your bathroom is not in a kitchen. There's no difference when it comes to, you know, breastfeeding and breast milk and what it is that you're trying to provide for your child. Some, some employers are really, really good for that. I know um, 
here in Montgomery, you have Wind Creek, you have Alpha, you have Target that are really, really good about supporting uh, their breastfeeding employees. I know for me, I, because I go from place to place, I'm having to create a plan and carve out a plan and say, hey, I need this, I need that. And the nurses typically help me make, and make sure I have what I need squared away and they don't make an issue of it. But I know if I don't come in with a plan, then it's kind of going to be like, oh, well, what, what do you want me to do about it? I'm, I'm not in necessarily the most supportive of situations when it comes to that. Um, so I definitely understand the struggle that people can encounter when it comes to that. It's not impossible. When you go back to work, like you all said, you just have to have a routine, have a regimen, and have a made up mind and stick to it. One thing I wanna get to is missing out. For the ladies, did anybody ever tell you that you were missing out or you were being tied down or breastfeeding was gonna mess up your life, you're gonna have saggy boobs or whatever um, because you made that choice? And if so, how did you handle it? Did you feel like that or was it like, uh, not really? <laughs> And I'll start with Cher and we can yeah. work our way through. I'm sitting here remembering back all those years. My best friend told me that when my daughter was born, I became very boring because I did not want to go out with her. I didn't want to go to movies. I didn't want to go anywhere. I just wanted to be there with my baby. And that lasted for a very, very, very long time. And I regret it not one bit because that time goes by so fast. Savannah, you want to add to it? Um, I would say I, I didn't miss out. Um, a lot of my really good friends, like I said, we were um, pregnant around the same time. Our babies are really close in age. Um, so we were all going on mommy dates together. Like, you know, we, we knew places that were breastfeeding friendly um, or where we felt comfortable and we went with the babies. Um, so it was never an issue of feeling left out, not at all. I think it has to do with the difference in time, you know, because this, the culture was so different back then and um, just a different world, that's about all I can say, for me and what you have today. And my friends were not breastfeeding, so I did not have that. Like I say, I, outside of La Leche League, I didn't have, know anybody else that was breastfeeding back then. And Layla, what about you? I'm sorry, what was the question again? Um, did you kind of, when you made that decision to breastfeed, did you ever mm -hmm. get, oh, you're missing out, you're gonna miss out, your boobs are gonna stay, you're gonna be tied down all the time. Did you ever get any of those comments? <laughs> um, no, uh, I don't know. I think kind of similar to Sharon was saying, like it depends on the time. For me, it was my circle of friends that I had. Um, Everybody was excited that I was having a baby. So people would come to visit me often and they tried to be as encouraging as they could with the breastfeeding. But again, if it's something that you haven't personally experienced, it was kind of hard for me to really take their advice. But I've never had anybody telling me like, you're missing out or um, you're boring, like she <laughs> said. It was a matter of they wanted to be around me and be around the baby and I wanted to be around my baby too. I mean, I'm pretty sure we all, even when they're asleep, we're probably staring at them, watching them breathe. <laughs> yes, yeah, Savannah. I've had mothers. I would literally. Go ahead, Savannah. I was gonna say, like, when my baby went to sleep, I would literally like put my hand on his like back or something just to make sure I can see it going up and down because I'm staring at it like, is he asleep? Is he all right? Like, I spent plenty of nights up just I wake up and I check and just go back to sleep like that. I, I get that. I completely understand. Uh, Cause I wanted to know like that I, I'm in charge of that human. I got to take care of that human. So I got to make sure that they're okay. Uh, so I, I'm mm -hmm. used to that. Said I want to take kind of the same question and ask and pose it to you. Cause it's a big deal when it comes to dad. Did you feel like because your wife chose breastfeeding that, Hey, you know, I'm missing out. She's giving more attention to these kids than me. Hey, it's not the same, you know, when it comes to um, intimacy. How, what, what is your position or what is your experience when it's on that? I mean, it is a dispensation in time that you'll never get back. And for that small time period of inconvenience, 
to make sure that your children have everything that they need in order to build a foundation that will take them further in the life. I mean, uh, being somebody, I've, 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 I've read the research on the benefits of breastfeeding and how those children compare going forward into the future and what the probability and possibilities are for them versus those who weren't. And mm-hmm. so um, being conscious of that, um, it's not even a sacrifice. It is, um, it is a, I guess it's almost, it's almost like an honor and a privilege to to even be in a situation where my wife can breastfeed, um, especially seeing situations where we, we I mean, because I remember when, when we did have those struggles with our firstborn and, you know, and she wasn't so sure and she wasn't confident and she wasn't, you know, we had those supply moments and things like that. And so, no, nah, it is, no. Nah. I mean, looking at the fact that when, you know, somebody looks at my, I mean, I remember my oldest was like three years old. I'm, I'm just saying like hindsight is twenty twenty. but when my, my oldest was like three years old, I remember we was over, over at a friend's house and my, and the guy was like staring at my son and he was like, he was just looking at him because he was like, man, I ain't never seen a three-year-old that cut before. You know, like, oh man, your son is like, man, that, that, he's like developed. I'm like, huh? I'm like, huh? I'm like, no, I'm like, well, I, I've been around my son the whole time. I didn't realize that um, from, you know, the, you know, m- maybe it's genetics, but I mean, but still it was, oh, no, nah, m- my kids are pretty stout. Like my kids are pretty healthy. They are, um, they are not behind at all. I mean, as far as developmentally wise, um, I think the advantages. So, so no, I'm, me, my, I'm always, I'm like, I'm like Ashley, when it comes to perspective, self-talk, you, you, you have to look at, you have to look at the light. You can't look at the dark, the darkness. I mean, darkness is here. You're going to, you, you can't beat, I mean, darkness was here when you got here. You came out of darkness. I'm like, you stay in the light, stay in the light. And so in, in staying in the light, um, it is, no, I'm like, I'm not, I'm not worried about whether I, I know I know what it took to get my babies here. You know, it took time to get my babies here. And you know, and so, you know, like let's pause on that for a second and, and make sure that, you know, make sure that they're right. You know. I, yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm just different. You may I maybe you got the right one. Maybe you should have got somebody else that had something else. But I mean when it comes down to it, I'm like, man, look, breastfeed. If it's up to me, I'm like, man, we go to four or five. My wife, she's like, hey, mm, I ain't doing that. But as far as I'm concerned, I'm like, look, as long it, does it benefit our does it benefit our child? Yes. I'm like, okay, that's all that matters. And your perspective is so refreshing because not everybody has that. Every not everybody has that support system when it comes to dad. They just don't. And so to have your perspective, we have the absolute right person because we need to hear that. Um, that hey, you're doing the research. Hey, you see the benefits. Um, you know it's something that your kids need. You're able to look down the road, and I think you said your oldest son is seven, and seeing how that's impacted him um, and your children's development physically and mentally, all of those different things. I think that's great to hear, especially coming from a dad, especially yes. because, you know, typically – um is mom who they say is sitting up in the middle of the night on google trying to figure out this 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 that uh but to hear hey i'm I'm doing the research and i'm on board with whatever it is that my wife wants to do and yes this was important yes there's a great benefit no i ain't missing out on nothing because i know how to get it going again <laughs> yeah. i think all of those things are very very important in this particular conversation absolutely um and your perspective like i said is so refreshing and it is very much so needed and i'm really really grateful to have it and i'm sure anybody else that's um on this particular call is grateful to have it and to hear it as well like i said it's is much needed on the developmental piece so you say you looked into the benefits you you know you see what it is we know that particularly um in the african american community when it comes to health care or health in general that everything all the bad things affect us disproportionately for lack of better words everything from you know your chronic illnesses like your diabetes your hypertension all these different things and it affects the kids it affects the kids uh was that a factor for any of you outside of cedric 
when it came to making that choice to breastfeed, looking at, okay, this is the outcome. This is the possibility. Hey, maybe I can curtail this or kind of stave this off if I make that choice. Was that a factor in that for you? I will say that um, uh, my husband's going to kill me, but he was probably whatever the opposite of Cedric is. Uh, <laughs> for the first, um, the first probably six months, I think after that, he flipped a script and became extremely like, oh, this is what we're doing. Uh, but in the beginning, you know, seeing he was the youngest, he had never grew up around children. He didn't know anything about babysitting. He certainly didn't, didn't know anything about nursing. And so in his mind, this was just... Now the baby's just attached to you. She won't go to anybody else. Everything is terrible, okay? So, and so that was the beginning uh, of it. Um, I also want to say uh, that I kind of knew that was going to happen, which has also played into me deciding to come home and be home full time and to uh, work for myself because I knew there was a level of, of nurturing even for him that it was going to take and to be able to create still a sense of normalcy for him uh, while I was doing it. And it, this was, I was looking at 15 steps and arguments ahead to know, okay, let me make this decision for all of us and be at home and let him see both sides of the coin and how, you know, other ways in which I can make money while still being able to take care of my children. Um, but I, I'd say that when he really, it, I think she was probably maybe right at 18 or 19 months and uh, we went to the doctor. No, she was almost two. And we went to the doctor and she had her very first ear infection. And the doctor, he was there and the doctor said, this is her first time? And we were like, yeah. She was like, what? okay, mom, good job. Mom. She was, and she was, and she was talking, she just kind of was talking about how breastfeeding, I, which I had done some research, but breastfeeding was helping with a lot of those things. It was helping from, uh, she, she rarely ever got sick. She rarely ever had um, any issues. And the, the doctor was, uh, she was saying it as kind of being funny, but I told you she was very progressed. And I, she knew about my husband too. So I think she was uh, helping me out there too. But, um, but yeah, it was like, I knew. And then he later on was like, I'm so glad you did that because now we didn't even start daycare until she was around 19 months. And he was starting to understand and see the difference when he was meeting other parents who were having other issues. And he was realizing like, oh, okay. So the breastfeeding actually was preventing a lot of that, was stopping a lot of those, those colds every 10 seconds and those ear infections. And, I'm, and I was explaining to him, you know, how it works and how the body creates its own kind of, for lack of a better term, antibodies to help the baby, you know, and, and it was like a different level of like uh, an aha moment, I think for him that, oh, okay. So now on the back end, I get it. And I understand it, uh, even though, um, in the beginning, especially the first six weeks, because he's like, why are you crying in a corner? Just stop, you know? So, mm -hmm. so, so mm -hmm. he was like, this doesn't make no sense. You crying, I'm not, we not getting it, doing nothing. And like, this just is just ridiculous. And so it wasn't until later that he began to realize it. And that was really, for me, that was the very most, the biggest important part was that I felt like, like, this is like my version of, of, uh, supporting my baby. Like, this is how I can do it. This is how I can keep her healthy. This is how I can make sure that she's getting the supplements that she needs. And I knew that, you know, I can eat right and I can do what I'm supposed to do on my end and know that it can work for her. And I, I'm not sure you tell me if you're going to get to this or not, but I also knew if there was things I had to take out my diet, things I had to do differently, I did whatever I had to do to my body to make sure the baby was okay. There was not ever a time in which I felt like, well, I'm just gonna do this other thing. I'm not about to stop my show. If I take out dairy, then I'm done with dairy. Whatever, I just stopped eating dairy. You know what I mean? So it was, I made sure to say whatever I needed to do to make this baby um, the healthiest that she can be, I'm gonna do it. And that was, um, and I was very grateful that now he gets it, especially with number two. Although he's still not, he's still not happy about other parts that, you know, he says it's, but still, he was like, you know, he gets it. And he's like, this is not even a thought. This is what you're doing. And I'm appreciative that you can do it. And I don't know if anybody wanted to add anything else. Um, Ashley, you mentioned changing up your, you know, changing up your diet, kind of changing up parts of your lifestyle in order to be accommodating and make sure that baby gets exactly what they need. And thankfully our bodies do their jobs. Even when we don't do right, our bodies still, right. still do their job to prioritize the baby. 
Um, Savannah, did you ever find yourself in that position? Layla, Cher, did you all ever find yourselves in that position where you feel like you were kind of changing things? I will say when I was breastfeeding, I think I was the healthiest um, I, because I was eating right. I knew if I ate, you know, green beans or something that it would give me, give the baby gas. And so I knew there were certain things I could and could not eat. Um, so I was a lot more healthier now. Oh my goodness. I will probably eat a cheeseburger and fries every day. Um, and so, yeah, w when I was breastfeeding, I was, I was healthy, but now it's just whatever can, can fill me up. Layla, what about you? Similar to Savannah, I think like my, my pregnancies and, um, with, with trying to breastfeed, those were the times where I, I think I was like at my healthiest. I was more conscientious of what I was putting into my body um, than ever before. And um, it's, it's just so funny. My husband will always say like, wow, it takes for you to get pregnant, for you to really take care of yourself. But that is like so, so true because in my mind, it's just like, this, this, this is for my baby. I want to make sure that she is okay and that she has everything that she needs. Um, so it always trumps whatever it is that I really, really want to do <laughs> or want to consume. And what about you, Sherry? Well, I just want to say that I've um, always told mothers, you don't need to change your diet to breastfeed. And I think a lot, there's so much emphasis put on the diet and what can I add to my diet or take out of my diet. Um, and I, myself, had one of my biggest struggles with my baby was that she was extremely colicky, screamed 24 hours a day for months. I'm not talking about weeks, I'm talking about months. So of course everybody blamed it on my breast milk and my breastfeeding. Um, again, if I hadn't found the Leche League to help me through this, um, and I did try taking out dairy. I did try all of that. It had no effect. Now, and that's not saying it won't for some, but we've learned a lot more now about colic and all of that. But what I want to say about the diet is, you think about women in third world countries, they don't have access to a healthy diet. Many of them are living on a handful of rice a day. But what we've learned about these, if you study these people, the mother may be in a state of malnutrition, but she has a big, fat, healthy, breastfed baby on her hip because mother nature does what it needs to get that milk the best it can for the baby. And so it's pulling from the mother's body to give the baby what they need. So I think it's, it's wonderful how mother nature designed this that um, and if you go to McDonald's every day, you may not be the healthiest person, and that's important. You need to be healthy for your baby, but your baby will still be healthy. So it's, I've had mom say, I'm not going to breastfeed because I don't think I eat healthy. That is, that is a poor excuse. Does not matter. If nothing else, at least it's some incentive. I think it's our maternal instincts that make us want to do better. Like, okay, yes, we're going to do better. We're going to do better. We're going to do better. So like you said, the baby's going to get what they need. Hopefully we do the right thing by ourselves and get what we need as well in the process. Um, kind of along the same lines and share, because I know you're an IBCLC, you have a very broad scope of practice when it comes to this. So when it comes to medications, um, a lot of people are dealing with chronic illnesses and feel like, oh, well, no, 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 I, I got to take insulin every day, so I can't breastfeed, or oh, no, 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 I'm taking a statin every day, so I can't breastfeed, or oh, I got diabetes, so I can't breastfeed. You, you have 150 different things, or oh, no, no, if I get a cold, if I get the flu, if I get whatever, I'm not going to be able to breastfeed, even down to COVID. If I get COVID, I can't breastfeed. I can't, I can't do this and breastfeed. Cher, what do you say to those particular things when it comes yep. to medications or having to pump and dump, or you just can't do it at all? That, that we've come such a long way in our research and our knowledge now about how medications affect breastfeeding. Um, and you have to remember that when somebody says a medication is safe, I'm going to give you a quick example. I had a mother tell me once when I went to see her that with her first baby, she was put on a medication at birth 
for herself for a problem and told um, that it was safe for breastfeeding. Well, that doctor was only looking at the fact that it was safe for the baby. What he hadn't looked at was it was not safe for her milk supply. So now we have um, that knowledge and we know we have to look at this from a two person perspective. But almost all the medications today are safe for breastfeeding, especially if they've been used for a long time. And so if you're put on a brand new trendy drug that we don't have information about, that's not the best choice for a breastfeeding mother. And, and hopefully most doctors know that, that they should pick a tried and true drug to put on a mother on. Um, one of the wonderful things for diabetics, we know that diabetic women actually tend to need less insulin when they're breastfeeding. Um, it's, it's almost like they're, they will tell you they are healthier in that state. Mother nature just protecting women in some way when they're breastfeeding. There are, yes, some very rare exceptions you can call any lactation consultant at a hospital in this city and they can answer questions for you about drugs. Um, Tom Hale, who writes the book Medications and Mother's Milk and updates it every other year, is the leading researcher and is constantly doing research in this field um, to categorize these drugs. And there are just so few that are contraindicated. I think that's good information to know because that can become a barrier too and you feel like well hey well my doctor said I can't do this and take that and I think a lot of times they just don't want to absorb the liability um mm -hmm. even though you have things like mommy mommy meds and the infant risk center um I want to say it's at the University of Texas but you can just look those things up that's Tom Hayden yes yep and, it, and it'll tell you exactly what's what and what uh schedule the drug is and all of those different things and like you said most of them are safe in lactation so that's always good to know and that's something you can access at the at the tip of your fingers I know I've had to point my providers in that direction sometimes too. And my husband being a supportive dad will he'll often remind us like, hey, she's breastfeeding. Can we do this, 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 this? <laughs> um, he's a, he, he's a cheerleader in that in that respect as, uh, as well. I want to ask a question. I want to pose this to Savannah and Ashley because you two nurse toddlers basically. And at <laughs> any point in time, anybody say anything to you about still nursing you still doing that you're some toddlers no nah, you just need to go ahead and win you just just let it go you, they, they don't need that anymore you're doing that for you know for you that's not for them it ain't nothing in there that kind of thing instead i don't know how far your wife went but i want you to chime in on that too if she went past the age of one you can go savannah okay um i will say by the time my my both of my kids started walking they were like all right now it's time for table food. You can give them some milk, and you can go on. And I'm like, no, we're we're gonna we're gonna do this for for a little while. We're gonna try as long as we can. Um, and a lot of people, I promise, in my family was like, you know, you're just you're doing that for you. Like at some point, that baby doesn't need your breast milk anymore. Give him some juice. Give him something. Um, and I think in that moment is when my husband really stepped in and said, no, that's her decision. If it's gonna help my baby, she's gonna do it. Um, and one of the biggest success I had is my, um, my two-year-old at the time, he got RSV, um, and we took him to the doctor and, you know, at the time it was going around a lot, like a lot of babies were being put in the hospital for it. And my doctor, he was like, you know what, if you're still breastfeeding him, keep doing it. He was like that. I'm not going to give you any medication. He doesn't need to go to the hospital. He was like, he will be fine. You're doing what you're supposed to do. Your body is going to help him out. Um. And everybody then understood that it's okay to breastfeed longer than those 12 months or those six months. Do it as long as the baby is going to need it. Now, at two years old, I was like, all right, I'm, I'm tired. He, he's good. They're both good. And I, I was finished. Um, but other people had to see the benefits in that because at first it was just a lot of um, nagging and negative energy that they were giving me um, to stop. I think... Um... I may be similar to Cedric's wife. So I think people kind of realize they better not try me. Um, <laughs> after so long, once they saw, you know, and and I mean, I was, I, I literally put her in a front pack and would be nursing her from the front pack. Like I was that mom. So it was like, you better not, like you just let me do what I'm doing. Um, and so I think that that is the, 
you like you really have to be confident that you are gonna know what you're gonna say before it is even necessary you know be prepared mentally so you can keep going and and when she she just wanted to be a big girl and and drink out of my cup you know and so it got to where she didn't feel like she's like you know i don't want to do that anymore but i promised myself until she was ready until she wanted to stop i wasn't gonna stop and i think that um that's really what it took was just for me to know you know like i think some what you said you're doing this for the healthiness of the baby and so babies i'm not sure if you say if you said you were ready i'm not sure if your baby was ready but uh but babies tend to i thought she just kind of she decided she didn't want to anymore and i was okay with that and the whole she started walking around 10 months and yeah that whole idea of all of a sudden just magically they don't need to breastfeed anymore like you're just gonna you know so i don't know i think it's a it's gonna be a confidence level in you and um like she said the la leche league there's facebook groups that are supportive of 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 nursing and then you see them and they're talking about 24 months 30 months you know and you see that um and you're like oh okay girl you know and then um in my in my what is that support class which if anybody can go to a support class and you have any issues just go to the class if you can figure out a way to go go to the class the the breastfeeding support class because i had a woman who had a newborn and a three-year-old and they were both nursing you know, and I was like, I just was in pure, I was like, this is, this is amazing. I didn't even know you could do that. I thought that, you know, I was like, you can't, but I guess people have twins, you know, I just didn't even think that that was even possible to see. And he, you know, and so it was, it was that, I think just the other day, now that I have a newborn, she's like, uh, I want to do that, you know, and I was like, mm -hmm. <laughs> whatever. So I think it's just going to be a, it's going to be a process in your own mind to just be confident and say, you know, I'm going to do this. If I can go as long as I can, I'm going to go. And it's all about the baby. It's all about the health of the baby. You just keep saying that and be prepared to say that to the side eye people too. And then you'll be good to go. Yeah, um, I think, um, I guess every child was different for us. Um, like I say, my wife didn't really, I don't really know what my wife's plan was. I know with Cedric, it was probably when my wife did go back to the workforce. I think that was when it happened. But uh, Levi, Levi was supplemented um, because my wife was working. So sometimes her supply would get short and we would have to supplement with that, uh, that form. That's how I found out how much formula was. Um, it wasn't until the second child. Um, and then with Levi, Levi started walking in like eight months. Like literally he stood up in the middle of the floor and just started walking like, he just said, "All right, I'm through." And you know, and if you and if you see Levi, you know Levi. Levi is like, I mean, he, he's three year old. He's three years old, but he's probably big as some five year old. And um, yeah, so he, you know, he was on table food as soon as he could. As soon as his teeth would allow him to, he was like, "I'm eating." Um, so yeah, no, but now uh, baby number three, like I say, it's. Um, it's whatever she chooses to do. I mean, I, I, maybe, maybe I'm just, maybe I'm just that far liberal to the point where I'm just like, you know what? It's what you want to do. It's like, if you want to do three years, fine. I mean, I, look, if I, I, I don't care. It is the baby, the, 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 is the baby okay? It's like, are you okay? It's like, okay, you don't want to do it anymore. Like, I think with my wife, I think that's probably what it was with, it, with my wife. I think when she got tired of getting bit, I think that was the part when she was like, all right, well, no, nah, we done. And so it's like, okay, it's up to the wife, it's up to the to, to my wife, to, to the mother and the baby. It's like, if the mother says, okay, I'm through with it, all right, fine. Support, all right, cool. All right, what we need to do from there? All right, the baby says, now nah, the baby says I'm done. I mean, the baby's just done. Like. You know, it depends. I mean, I know my kids. Like my oldest son, the when he was done, he done. And it was just like, I'm not eating carrots either. I'm not eating carrots and I'm not eating bananas. It's like, okay, fine. It's it's you you get what you you get what you get. You don't pitch a fit. And that's our rule in our household. So um yeah, so no, nah, it's it's like is it weird? Nah, is it weird for me if I, if my wife said we're gonna go on with Chloe until you know, time, time ends. I mean, like, no, nah, I, mean, I don't care. So, but 
I mean, like I said, if it's not harming the child, which which breastfeeding is like not harm. I mean, like for real though. I'm like when you start looking up what breast what breast milk can do, it's like man, I'm trying to figure out why we don't even sell it in stores. Like like it need to be right there next to the monster milk. Like like for real. Like you trying to get buff, you trying to lose weight. Better get you some breast milk, cause cause that's the that's mother nature's key to life right there. Cause yeah, mm-hmm. but no, um, but yeah, no, I'm, but that's because I know I'm like, I'm looking at I'm looking at my son at seven years old. People are like okay, put their seven year old next to my son, and I'm saying that's a huge difference. It's like your son is different. Like, I know I'm six foot two, but your daddy's six foot five, but my son looks like, okay, all right. And I'm like, and only thing in my mind, I'm thinking to myself, it ain't what we feed him because he eats like a mouse. I'm like, it's the breast milk. It's that breast milk. I'm like, and so if my, if my son ever gets to that point and somebody be like, oh, well, he's professional athlete and stuff like that. I'm be like, his mama, it's them, it's those mm-hmm. it's those months, those years that that we decided that we were going to commit to early development that probably was the catalyst to get him where he's going. Because when you look at what's in our food today, when you look at how much nutrition is actually there, how much we have to supplement. I mean, you can eat, you can be a vegetarian, eating a healthy lifestyle, and still have to supplement for vitamins and other nutrition. So I'm like, yeah. And going back to what Cher said, I'm like, look, breast milk, that is going to have what it needs to have inside of it, regardless of what that mother's diet looks like. So yeah, no, I'm I'm like all aboard, choo-choo, let's go as long as we can. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna jump in here and say that um, I breastfed longer than all of you. I did not, it wasn't something like I said I ever was planning to do. I just set a goal for three months. Um, La Leche League changed my life because that's the, how I learned about toddler nursing. I had never heard of that concept. And I remember the first time I sat there with an infant and watched a two-year-old get off off the floor and, and run across the room and jump up in his mother's right. lap and start nursing. And I think a lot of the people in the room had their mouth wide open because um, that was so new to me. So um, I continued on and, and I want to encourage mothers to do this as long as it is comfortable for you and your baby. That is what is best. There is no point that breast milk has no more value. It does not lose value. And I've heard doctors say that to women. Oh, well, the baby's already nursed so long. They've got all they need. Not true. Your body will always be making antibodies. So if you are still nursing that child, whatever the age is, they're getting antibodies to help fight infection, even if even if they're not getting a lot of milk. Um, many mothers will quit pumping or breastfeeding because they say, oh, my baby's only getting one feeding a day of breast milk and it wasn't worth it. Not realizing that the antibodies actually become more concentrated in the breast milk as the supply goes down, almost mother nature's way of giving that baby a last ditch effort at, at health. So do it as long as you can. I did not, I don't share with people how long I nursed because I don't see it as, a, as something that we get an award for just because I nursed so many years. Um, and each child is different. It was because my child wanted to nurse that long that I did it that long. And I think a lot of mothers that haven't nursed a toddler don't realize the joys of it how, and the wonderful ways that it can help make uh, toddlerhood easier but also that it can be hard on women after a while as time goes by. It can be more uncomfortable, Um, but it is no mother I'll ever say, I regret doing it, I don't think. Layla, I wanna pose this question to you. Um, While I know you didn't go as long as you initially planned to, you still, you actually went longer than a whole lot of people, I'm gonna be honest with you. You, I mean, I know it may feel like a, a personal, um, a personal, you know, angst with yourself or something because yeah. you didn't go as long as you want to. You actually went longer than a lot of people. Not that it's a race or a comparison. I want to make that very clear. Um, but you attempted and you made the effort. My question to you is if, because I can't say when, 
if there is a next time, <laughs> um, what do you think you, what, what's one thing you think you would do differently? Um, just establish a, a real support system and, and make conscious decisions um, with the doctor that I use, even the hospital that I use. I think that was probably, that would have made a world's difference just kind of thinking back to my experience, especially with my first pregnancy, because I was kind of just going through my pregnancy, kind of like at the disposal of the doctor, listening to only what the doctors are telling me. And if I'm going to a facility that's not exactly pro-breast or that's not really pushing forward, then that that won't, it won't be able to help me so much. So I think one thing differently is just how I surround myself, what type of support system I'm going to have around me, um, and really digging into my, 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 my grit and my ability to be resilient. I think one thing that, that keeps coming to mind is just such the, such the difference between who I am today and who I was and how I thought and what mindset I had when I was 20 and 21. <laughs> and literally, you know, just about to finish undergrad, you know, um, I think now I, I'm better equipped and I'm, I'm more aware and I'm, I'm making more conscious decisions. And that's one thing differently that I would do is be more conscious with the decisions that I make. You got regarding breastfeeding and said it could be you and or your wife. What's the best piece of advice you got? Be oh wait, you blinked out for I'm one sorry. second. The, the best you froze for you all received. Did y'all hear me? One more time. I'm sorry. <laughs> the, the best piece of advice you all received around breastfeeding. And anybody can take that. Anybody? I'll can jump take. in. <laughs> the best piece of advice I heard at a LHA League meeting the very first time I went, and it had to do with all the advice you're given by your family, your friends, complete strangers saying, oh, you have a new baby, let me give you a piece of advice. And it was to listen to it all, to thank them all, and then do what your heart tells you is right. And that, that was definitely the best, best piece of advice I got. Eat the meat and spit out the bones. Yeah. I live by that. <laughs> I listen. I guess I'll say it was before I ever, ever even started when I was pregnant. And I know it's such a simple little thing, but someone told me, well, you, I, I want you, they say, or they told me breast is best, right? And, and although that seems like so small, but it was my first kind of even mention into looking into fully breastfeeding um, when they kind of just were saying about that. And so it was like my little, my little jumping off point for me. I found out I was pregnant to learn about, you know, breastfeeding and, and lengths and all the, the great things that it can do. Cause I was like, well, why, you know, and I had found out. And so I would say that was probably my start. Um, that was really kind of just, that got me kind of thinking about, how important it would be to actually nurse. So the best advice I got was from um, one of my former clients when I first started um, going back out into the field when I came back from maternity leave, I, I had told her um, that I was breastfeeding um, older lady, um, and she said to me, and I, and I take this everywhere I go, she said, a brown cow still yields white milk. Um, and she said, even though you don't have a lot of support around you, know that you can still do it. Know that, you know, you can do this as long as you need to, um, and that your milk supply is still good. Um, and I use that in every aspect of my life, um, just because it's not, you know, it can be transformed into anything. Um, but that was truly one of the things that pushed me um, into breastfeeding as long as I could. You know, a brown cow still yields white milk. Um, 
I take it, I guess, in terms of me, my perspective, uh, what led me down the road of trying to be a supportive dad uh, was something that I actually just learned in life. And that is know what you don't know. Um, there was a, uh, I guess, attributed back to a philosopher that says, uh, beginning of wisdom is to know that you don't know. And it's, um, I didn't know a lot. I didn't know a lot about being a supportive dad. I didn't know what, anything about that. And so in having conversations with my wife, uh, she would just tell me about like, oh, well, I'm a member of this group. And I mean, I think it was a Facebook group that actually helped her a lot. Um, I think some a group for chocolate moms or something like that. Um, and of course, I'm friends with Adila, and so I would be looking at her stuff, and I'd be like, "Oh, that's good stuff!" Like, let me click share because you know, like, it ain't it ain't for me, but I mean, it's like, look, we need to know this. Like, this is information we need to know in our community, and so, um, especially understanding um, the health disparities as it relates to it. Um, Adila pointed out, I'm from Lowndes County, Alabama. Um, I mean, I've. I, I've heard reports, I've read reports about my home county that referred to those people as living in a third world country. And so essentially to have those resources to know, like, look, when your household income is less than a third of the poverty line, um, to know that, hey, this breastfeeding will not only make sure that Look, you save money, but no, it'll make sure that these children at least have a chance. And uh, with the way our culture has been set up, with the way that we have uh, provided excuses, and, I, and, I, and I'll be very clear um, in terms of what I do, uh, I advise clients all the time that, look, when you give yourself a, a multitude of options, you no longer have options, you have excuses. And... And when you give yourself a way out, when you give yourself a way out, you, you give yourself an opportunity not to try. And, you know, I remember a guy talking about Michael Jordan said, you look, you miss a hundred percent of the shots you never take. And so look, we have to, as dads, I mean, this is for the men. I would say, look, look, it is important that you support the mother of your children um because this is a hard thing it's a hard thing to have to wake up every few hours to be tired mm -hmm. to be miserable to to give your body to have your body literally you, you, she already had to go through nine months she already had to go through that point of sharing the insides and now now you know it went from you know that to now she's got this symbiotic relationship she went from being a parasite to being this symbiote that attaches itself every three to six hours for numerous amounts of time and her whole body shifts. Like, like, look, I, I say, look, men, know what you don't know about breastfeeding. Know what you don't know about how it impacts, not just your child, how it impacts the mother of your children so that um, you are, you know, like, look, something's, so that you'll know, A, if something's off, um, two, so that, you know, you don't stop being a jerk. I mean, it's not about you. So it's like, look, hey, it's, it's quarantine season. I'm like, look, that gave me an excuse to go buy two new grills. Like I now come home early just so I can grill in my backyard. And, you know, it allows me to do what I need to do because in helping facilitate her, helping to take support her, it allows me to be able to do plans so I can do what I need to do. So it's not taken away from anybody. It's know what, know what you don't know so that you can make better decisions. And so with our family, it has been, um, it has worked. It has worked. Um, and so, no, sorry, but not sorry. Look, you don't know everything. Please ask somebody who doesn't know some ask somebody who knows because yeah you don't know everything yeah i appreciate all the nuggets and i'm sure everybody else does too i know the best thing that i was told was learn before the baby gets here 
Okay. Learn before the baby gets here. You don't get a driver's license and a car on the same day. Learn before the baby gets here. That's the best thing I was told. Um, and it worked out pretty well for me thus far. Um, I know we need to wrap up. We want to be conscious of everybody's time. If anybody has any questions that they want answered, put it in the Q&A section. This question that is here is for share. Uh, it says, I'm having trouble with super sore nipples and bleeding. I'm using nipple cream and the moisture pads at night. Do you know of something else I can do? I've been breastfeeding for two months and I didn't have this problem with my first child. Oh, gosh. Yes, that was my story, too. Um, yeah, you definitely need help. You need to see somebody that knows what they're doing, i.e. a lactation consultant that can watch you, uh, your baby latch on. I always, um, if it's an experienced mother and you're saying that you are, then I know that you know something's wrong and that nipple cream is not going to solve the problem. And, and it's a shame that, that women will go on for so long thinking that, oh, I've just got to get through this time and it's going to get better. But no, you definitely need help, um, professional help. And I would call the hospital where you delivered and try to make an appointment. I'm not sure, are lactation consultants doing consults? Does anybody know right now in the hospital because of COVID? I am not sure. Um, they're only on the phones as far as I know. Okay. They're not coming out of the hospital and I don't think they're letting anybody in that's not an admitted patient either, at least not the local hospital. But so even not. then, I know myself, if a mother called me with that problem, I could dialogue with her and help give her some guidance to work through this. I, I mean, ideally, somebody would, would like to see, but I think she can give you some tips. Um, the lactation consultant at the hospital where you delivered should be able to give you some tips to get you in a different direction. Because all the nipple cream in the world is not going to resolve a problem that's gone on that long. Um. And thank you for that share. I think that's the only uh, question that we had pop up in the question and answer section. I know Ashley answered a question that was directed at her in the chat already about her uh, tandem nursing. She said, no, she did not tandem nurse. <laughs> uh, meaning nursing both her kids at the same time. She did not. Um, I don't think we have any more questions and answers that have popped up in the box. Um, and just for the sake of time, y'all, we really cannot get to all of these questions that we're <laughs> trying to print it out. But I thank you all for your time um, and your input. Your perspective has been amazing. It is my hope that somebody gleans of, from whatever it is that you all have said and gets some type of piece of hope or encouragement along the way. I hope that somebody who's not even planning to breastfeed uh, is saying, hey, now I know how I can support somebody who is breastfeeding or who does plan to breastfeed. Um, and I just hope that just becomes a trend within our community, not just a trend, but a staple of our community because trends come and go. I hope, it be, I hope it becomes a staple within our community. I hope it reclaim that because it's something that we did once upon a time um, and we hope it comes back to stay. Um, we have a, oh, here's my screen. Here it is. <laughs> we have the evaluation tool again. I want to, um, Make sure you give us that feedback. It's coming to your email address as soon as this is over. Just go ahead and complete it, especially those of you that are trying to obtain CEUs. We need that. And please be on the lookout for the last webinar as part of this series. Our last webinar in September, we'll actually have our first speaker back. So I'm really, really excited about that. Um, we thank you all for your time. Panelists, thank you for your time. You all have been amazing. Uh, thank you for your service. And that's all I have. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you.